Praise be to our God. Shall we turn our Bibles to the book of Amos, chapter 9, verses 11 to 15. We will read these verses responsibly. Book of Amos, this is in the Minor Prophets after Isaiah and after Joel, after Daniel, after Isaiah, after Joel. We come to get to Book of Amos. And uh, we will read from verses 11 to verse 15 responsively. Padakonda nunchi, padihen vachinalanu, uttara pratyutram ga chadukunam. Tadupari, pradhana purukunga den vakyam koruka in vaip chuddam. Let me read verse 11. Please read the alternate verses. In that day will I rise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doth this. The study in Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities, and inhabit, inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Verse 15, And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Let us pray and look to the Lord. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you that you have brought us to your house to worship the true and the living God, the God of the house of God, who is a God like unto thee, worthy to be given glory and honor. From the rising of the sun to the setting of it, your name is worthy to be exalted on high. Who is a God like unto thee, Lord, who shows mercy and pardons iniquity and deals kindly and restores and rebuilds ruins and makes a masterpiece out of it. And so, Lord, we come this evening longing that you take our lives afresh into your hands and uh, do all that you long to do in our lives that we may be made and mold into the shape and likeness that you long us to become for your glory. Father, I pray that you may speak to me, through me, to each one of us, unworthy as I am. And uh, may your word have free course in our lives this evening. Thanking and praising you, for we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We've uh, started to look at uh, the chapter 9. Last week from the book of Amos, and uh, we've seen the first 10 verses, a tough portion where it brings to us the theme of judgment of God. And uh, we've seen that in these first 10 verses, as I try to just break down the out and give us the outline for chapter 9, and then we'll dive more detailedly into uh, the verses that we read. So Chapter 9 verses 1 to 10 talks about the Lord who judges, the Lord judges. And then chapter 9 verses 11 to 15, it speaks to us about the Lord who restores. And uh, it is vital we get some key things from this portion from verses 1 to 10 before we get to verses 11 onwards of what the restoration is all about. When it comes to the judgment, there are Five, six things that we saw, I mean, uh, if we walk by the altar of the judgment, a God, he brings in this jolt of judgment right in the house of God, where as we see in every structure, it is the, um, we read the, the citadel there in King, King James translation. Um, they are the most strongest part of the structure. You see that in 
big big palaces the entrance is where there are mighty pillars that stand and uh, the strength of all that struck of, of all that building is going to be laid upon that opening entrance pillars that weigh the most uh, weight yes there is foundation underneath the foundation takes a lot of weight but upon the foundation every structure that is there the most heaviest or the load bearing ones are the pillars at the entrance or called the citadel or the entrance door and the lord stands at the altar and he says that there should be a jolt on that particular uh, uh the entrance so much so that the whole structure is going to collapse that everyone who is there in that structure or the temple is is going to be brought under utter destruction and that's the image that we see and so we see in these uh, few verses that our lord is the lord who who is the one who onsets the judgment he is the one who gives the jolt of judgment and then the certainty of judgment how it is inescapable unavoidable as we were reminded a god's judgment is certain not only that the imagery of judgment the prophet gives to us um of how many times though you do this though you do this in six times in verses 2 to 4 he goes on to say of all the ways how god is going to bring them to the judgment we'll see the reason for that but in verse 5 he's going to give to us an image an image of melting just by the touch of god there is a it's like iron that melts uh such is the image or the severity that we see the imagery of judgment and last three things that we see is the judge of the judgment there is a description of who the judge is in verse 6 we see that it is he that buildeth his stores in heaven hath founded the troops in the earth he that calleth the waters of the sea and poureth them out of the face of the earth out upon the face of the earth the lord is his name who is the one who is judging the very god of the universe his name as we see abraham says the judge of the whole earth as abraham calls he is the one who is at judgment not a puny king or not a few a little judge in a small court but the whole the judge of the whole universe he is calling out about this judgment and so not only that we see the people of judgment in verses 7 and 8a he says about these very children of israel that he drew them as from the land of egypt aren't you like the very other general nations like ethiopians isn't it i who drew you out to be a special nation and yet you behave this way and you are getting ready and living in such a way that is worthy of judgment and so the people of judgment and then finally that we see the remnant of judgment in verses 8b onwards though he destroys them he says in verse 8b i will not utterly destroy them he leaves a remnant he leaves a remnant and so as we look at this outline uh, i want you to draw with me two questions that helps us to prepare ourselves to consider the beauty and the magnificence of his restoring work uh so the two questions that bring uh to us as we looked at this outline in verses 1 to 10 is why judgment when we look at the pronouncement of judgment the obvious question that needs to come out is why judgment and uh, amos chapter 2 verse 7 as amos started to give the oracles of the judgment that god was pronouncing on the nation surrounding and followed by that upon the very nation of judah and then the nation of israel in chapter 2 verse 7 he gives the reason as to why this judgment is being invoked as god gives a succinct a simple one uh, a, a one phrase reason in amos chapter 2 verse 7 we read that pant after the dust of the earth actually from verse 6 onwards we see thus saith the lord for three transgressions of israel and for four i will not turn away the punishment thereof 
because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. There's a small description of why God is pronouncing judgment through Amos. They have sold righteousness, they have sold the poor. In a simple way, they have neglected what is important to the Lord. God's people, the so called God's people, have neglected righteousness and the poor. And then in verse 7, Amos continues and says, That pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek, and a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. What is it that brings judgment on even the so called the people of God? We see a God is a God who is holy and he has his fury on something called evil. His eyes are too pure to behold evil, as Habakkuk chapter 1 we read. And he doesn't, uh, he is not someone who can just ignore and shove it under the carpet and say, it's okay, I won't see. He is a God who deals with evil at its face with his fury and indignation. And so his holy name, as it was being put to shame, we come to see his fury coming upon him. In Amos chapter 5, there is a, a pleading call by the prophet in Amos chapter 5 verse 14. He says, seek good and not evil. Seek good and not evil. And uh, they have been seeking evil. and a very wonderful, I mean, a, a clear reason as to why we see the judgment. And beyond that, a wonderful thought about in the midst of the judgment, God has his remnant, it seems. Not only we should ask this question, why judgment? But why the remnant? That is something that baffles us. Because his holy anger should consume everything and utterly leave nothing but the ashes for the fury that needs to come upon them. In Amos chapter 9, verse 8b, we read, 8a, we read, Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from of the face of the earth. This should be what he should be doing. His anger and fury are worthy to bring forth utter destruction. But in the midst of that, there is a, a phrase that we see in verse 8b saying that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, say the Lord. Now, why this remnant? Why is it that God keeps his remnant? We find no answer except for something that is inherent in him. His inherent very nature that we find of how, as he revealed himself to the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 34 and to his leader and to their leader, when Moses wanted to know his very glory and his nature, in Exodus chapter 34, God reveals himself of his heart and his nature, his character. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, we read, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. This is the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible, just yes, he shows his fury and brings his vengeance on those that are duly deserving and yet in the midst of it he has a remnant. A remnant because of his very nature, the very nature of his mercy. Now, not only that we come to see about this, uh, these things, we're going to look at this portion that we read in verses 11 to 15 and just gather the outline before we work out to understand what the Lord has in store for us. Amos chapter 9 verses 11 to 15. Each of these verses gives to us about one aspect of what God is up to when he is restoring. Yes, he brought judgment. We understood the reasons for judgment. We now understand and are coming 
to grips with why the remnant and what he is going to do with the remnant. This remnant is something of a master plan that God has. And uh, as we walk through the outline, we come to understand in this restoring work, as we see in this portion, that there is the, a working out of his master plan. We see in verses 11 to 15, the theme of this few verses is the Lord restores. The Lord judges and the Lord restores. And as he restores, these are the things that he does in his restoration. The first thing that he does in verse 11 is, he's going to erect the tabernacle of David. In verse 11 we read, In that day will I rise, Will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. God's plan always begins with his promises. There's a precious promise that we find as we go back to the scriptures of all that he has given beforehand. Of what he is going to do. And uh, his plans are, are preciously preserved in these promises. Ever doubt or ever want to know what the plan of God is? Go back to the promises of God. You would see it masterfully hidden. And they are going to outwork itself in due time. And so here we see God has promised to David the very king of Israel, under whose rule the, very, the kingdom thrived like no other time. A master plan that in his son or in his line is going to establish his kingdom for ever. Yet, this, yes, this nation is worthy for destruction, but God has his plan for salvation. And we find that he's going to erect David's tabernacle. As we read in verse 11, not only does he erect the tabernacle of David, he's going to extend the territory. We see in verse 12 of the extension that they may possess the remnant of Edom, the surrounding nation, Edom. We, we studied through Obadiah of the reason why Edom is going to be brought under destruction. And here we find through Amos that that would be possessed by David or the resurrected or erected tabernacle of David, extended the erection of the temp tabernacle, the extension of the territory. Not only that, we find he expedites the harvest in verse 13. Very strange uh, image that we find in verse 13. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman will overtake the reaper. Somebody is plowing. Behind him, after many weeks, should the reaper come and reap all that they plow and wait for the harvest to come. But the, as the plowman is going, the reaper is hurrying to gather the harvest. Imagine how speedy is this harvest. How fast is the growth of that which they are plowing and, and sowing. Take note, the plowman is being followed. He's been overtaken by the reaper. And the treader of the grapes, him that soweth the seed. The one who is sowing the seed behind him, the one who is to thread the grapes. Meaning after the grapes are gathered, they are going to be put and they are going to be thread or trampled upon so that the wine can be brought out. So they can't wait. It's so fast. The harvest is so fast. We want to understand what that harvest is. And all this concern with how our lives are to be built. By a master builder. Moving forward we see in verse 14. He is going to escort his people back. In verse 14. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. And they shall build the waste cities. And inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards. And drink of the wine thereof. And they shall also make gardens. And eat of the fruit thereof. Here is people of God escorted back to the land. And lastly. Not the least. They're going to establish, they're going to be established, establish his people. As we find these five things that this small portion of the Lord's restoration gives to us, we're going to come to understand two questions that I would want to bring 
as we consider to understand this portion that will help us to bring us what god has in store for us this evening the first question that we see is that why the ruins yes we understood the question of why the judgment and followed by the question of why the remnant now here we need to understand why the ruins and what these ruins are before we can come to understand how the lord works out to restore if we don't i mean i think someone said this if you and i don't learn the lessons from history you are prone to repeat it it seems and we need to learn the key lesson of what amos was called by god to teach the children of israel why were they having to come to ruins because the answer is that there was no true seeking and god fearing lives the call that amos gives to god's people then and to us even today is from amos chapter 5 verse 14 it says seek good and we find um, as how so many things that they failed to seek they didn't seek his word we saw that in amos chapter 8 amos chapter 8 in verse 11 god had sent forth a famine not of food they were in great prosperity but a famine of the very word of god they were given the oracles of god and they didn't delight in it they didn't seek it they didn't want to understand the heart of god the very thoughts of god god's word given to us is his very heart and his thoughts a man of god says when you and i study the word of god in the bible it is to think his thoughts after him it seems if only we can know what god is thinking in the very situation that you and i are oh the treasure of wisdom oh the oh the greatness of the timely help and wisdom that you and i can have if we know what god is thinking for our lives right how many of us have to wait to know the will of god at times because most often we don't want to know the will of god but we want god to make our will his will and that's why god waits makes us wait and he's not going to reveal his word or his will until we come to say lord i surrender i want to do your will as and let your will be done when we set our hearts to say lord let your will be done and are willing to know his will to do his will he is more eager to give, give to us his will than we are eager to know his will it seems and so we come to see that they have not sought the very word of god they have not sought his presence god's presence is taken for granted when we don't seek his presence oh it's just the prayer time is just another day another week another day that we just can ignore tomorrow i can pray and we can postpone and we can take god's word and god's presence for granted when we don't seek his presence when we don't seek his word when we don't seek justice as amos chapter 5 verse 14 say verse 24 says let judgment or justice run down as water this is a god a god who loves judgment who seeks and shows mercy this is a god and when god's people failed to seek justice and judgment that's where they were led to ruins not only they didn't seek word seek his presence seek judgment but he didn't they didn't seek good in chapter 5 verse 14 seek good and not evil and last but not the least the greatest is they didn't seek him in chapter 5 verse 8 we see they haven't sought him neither they have feared him when the lion roars as the children say they don't they're not terrified of the lion's roaring so are we sometimes when god speaks we are not afraid we are careless and we are not trembling at his word and thereby our lives come to these ruins yes we might think ruins are those that so called people who didn't stop going to church so called people who are not in the word these days but even in our lives if you and i think of the ruins that are there 
over the ruins and the remains of our failures the failures in our relationships where when we think about our brothers or our sisters who are not yet in the lord we are called to be those that would have them be led into his fold we're still praying still seeing the ruins or oh, the ruins of the spiritual lives of our siblings of our children many a times do our children love his word do his love his love his presence and we think of all those god calls us to see the ruins in our lives in my life in your life and he is someone who can take those ruins if only we are willing and build something out of it as we would open up in the portion that is ahead we see there's a second question that would prepare us to consider the portion the first one is why the ruins and why the restoring we see that our god is a god who restores and it's not anything to do with you and me but he does this restoring primarily for his glory primarily for the promise that he has made because he is a promise making and a promise keeping god he is a covenant making and a covenant keeping god we break the covenant we don't keep the side of our part of that promise but he cannot he will not his plans cannot be thwarted he uses someone or the other to get past all that plan and promise and purpose that he has in store and that's why he restores for his glory and his promise and not only that he is his very nature is that he is a true master builder he can take ruins into his hands and bring out a masterpiece that is our god and so we come to this portion this evening as i title my message though in the middle of the sermon but yet um, we're going to consider the true wise master builder kattutarlo nijamaina naipunyata gala guru we have this title introduced in the scripture elsewhere who is the one who has this title that the scripture gives to us who is the wise master builder someone that you and i are familiar with and as i give the reference you and i would take note in a, in first corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 it pleased it pleased the god the holy spirit to let him have this title it that the scripture has been put as paul writes about himself paul says in first corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 he says there are many who started to build and we are also called to examine how we are building ourselves and in that context paul says i am doing it according to the grace of god which is given unto me as a wise master builder who is that puzzle paul puzzle paul he he is given this title truly but we don't have to just stop at the title of apostle paul if we just dig a little around what in what context apostle paul could write that in a, in a in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 he says jesus christ has become his wisdom and uh, in chapter 11 verse 1 he says follow me as i am following christ in that context when jesus was his wisdom when he was following christ to daringly say follow me many times men of god today in modern christianity they would say don't follow me follow christ right it is very terrifying to say follow me there's so many flaws in me and in us that we might dare not to say but god gave this grace to apostle paul where he could say follow me follow me as i follow christ and so when we think about apostle paul paul puts that phrase in the before he says according to the grace that was given to him he says i'm not worthy even to be called as an apostle but god by his grace i am what i am by the grace of god and there he was given this title a wise master builder 
Now, it is true that he is a wise master builder. Now, this question, in the light of that, we find another question. Who is the true wise master builder? Obviously, we now know who the true wise master builder is. In Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4, we read about God being the builder of all. And then in Mark chapter 6 verse 3, the scripture gives to us that he is the, is he not the carpenter's son? Is a question that is asked there in Mark chapter 3, 6 verse 3. Don't go there. But uh, what I want to take note is this word carpenter has the original root word to say builder. Someone who builds. Someone who builds with wood or someone who builds. In that sense, the true wise master builder is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And uh, now, there are two other questions and then we come to the application and close. It will be quick, but follow me there. Now, the question is, what are the ruins? We have looked at it in a little way. Um, and uh, we have, uh, we're going to ask one more question and then we'll go to the application. The, the first question is, as we are considering this theme of the true wise master builder, what is it that the Lord Jesus Christ builds? And uh, what are it, what are the ones that are ruins? That was, That is the one when we give those ruins to him, he's going to take it and make a masterpiece out of it. మరి శిథిలాలు అంటే ఏంటి అని చెప్పి మనం అర్థం చేసుకుంటే ఆ శిథిలాలను ఆయన చేతిలోకి తీసుకుని వస్తే ఆయన నైపుణ్యం కలిగిన ఒక నిజమైన కట్టువారిగా ఒక గురువుగా ఆయన కట్టువారిగా ఉంటూ ఉన్నారు అండ్ దీస్ ఆర్ ద థింగ్స్ దట్ ఆర్ రూయిన్స్ ఆర్ వెరీ లైఫ్స్ ఆర్ రిలేషన్షిప్స్ ఆర్ థింగ్స్ వాట్ ఎవర్ బీ ఇట్ దట్ గాడ్ ఇస్ ఇంట్రెస్టెడ్ టు అస్ ఇఫ్ దే ఆర్ నాట్ బీయింగ్ యూస్ ఫర్ క్రైస్ట్ and if our lives and our relationships if they are not fruitful in christ as they are brought to him he takes them and a mast and makes a masterpiece he builds them and so not only what the ruins are and quickly we see where do we begin for him to take and build a masterpiece out of it the next question is where do we begin where do we begin to let him build and obviously we started off in amos chapter 9 verse 11 it says god has kept a place where the rebuilding process happens and that is at the raised tabernacle of david at the raised tabernacle of david god has set a place where life's where relationships, where everything that is entrusted to us can be brought again to be rebuilt for his glory. And who is that raised tabernacle of David? We were reminded through the book of Matthew as well that in the line of David was come a Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the one who is the raised tabernacle of David. And as we come to give whatever we have into his very hands, he begins to build. And now this is the question that we would bring certain applications and close. How is this rebuilding going to happen? How is it that the Lord Jesus Christ does this restoring, rebuilding work? As we move, we read, turn with me as we were also reminded in our worship time in Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It's not trying to pull our bootstraps and uh, get some kind of self help to get over our ruins, but it has to be a supernatural work that God does. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we all know that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We read in Revelation chapter 21 verse 5, Jesus himself says, as he speaks to John in the revelation that he is given, he says, Behold, I make all things 
new. This is our God. He's someone who makes all things new. And the old things have passed away. They are to be renewed and restored and rebuilt by our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He's the one who builds us. He recreates us in His own image again. And He is the one who gives us a new life, a new heart, a new mind, a new purpose, so that we may be made a brand new creation. And from then comes this seeking. As uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This is not for someone who is an unbeliever. Many a times we take this verse to them. If you seek Jesus Christ or His righteousness and His kingdom, everything else will be added to Him or her. This message is given in the Sermon on the Mount that God gives to us. The Sermon on the Mount is for the kingdom citizens. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the one who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Who are these? Blessed are they that suffer and are persecuted for his namesake. They are the kingdom citizens. To them, God gives them this privilege of seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. You and I get to seek him only when we have this new mind. Only when we have this new heart. Until then, we will seek ourselves, our glory, or our own things. We will never seek him and we will never be the seeker. And that's why we read in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says, For it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. All have gone astray. Where are they seeking? What are they heading towards? They are heading to destruction. And why are they heading towards destruction? In Romans chapter 3, verse 11, we read, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. None. All have gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. This is the portion of everyone who is not in Jesus Christ. However good they might be, there is none that seeketh good. Why? They seek good or they seek whatever so-called God only to get the benefits of it. Not the true good or God. Because the moment you and I see God, I tell always this, that you and I are confronted with His holiness, His very nature. And so you will be terrified. And so, only when we come to Christ, the raised tabernacle of David, you and I are made a new creation and you and I are given a new heart and a new mind. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ. With that new mind and a new heart, our heart will be longing for righteousness. Our hearts will be filled for His kingdom purposes. And uh, that's when we would long for the fruit of righteousness. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 7, John the Baptist asked this question. To those that were coming for baptism, John the Baptist asked this straightforward question. In these modern days, if someone is coming for baptism, what we do? We'll just dunk them in. And oh, let's have more count. More baptisms, more good. But uh, when John the Baptist was having people, even the Pharisees and the Sadducees, as they were coming for baptism, this was the question that they asked. He asked them. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, uh, verse 7 onwards, you read, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Verse 8, he says, Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. He wants to see the fruit of repentance before he can give baptism. If there is no fruit of repentance, if there is no fruit of righteousness, a hunger for righteousness, there is no need of baptism in, in, his, in the statement that John the Baptist is giving to us. And so here we come to see 
that the Lord builds first and foremost us before he can use us to build his his kingdom and his in his church he first builds us there's no one who can serve the lord until he's first served until he's first made a new creature there is no way we can serve him yes you might do a lot of work cleaning work even preaching work also people do but until they are served first of that salvation they cannot truly serve the lord jesus christ yes so the lord rebuilds us first not there he doesn't stop there he builds he rebuilds your and my home we all know this right in psalm 127 except the lord builds the house those that build or or labor it is in vain it is all vain effort until the lord builds the house except the lord gives the heritage of the fruit of the womb we cannot build our homes in of our own human effort the lord is the one who builds our home in verses 1 and 3 he is the one who builds our home as he builds our home we need to let him be the lord of our lives if he is not the lord of our lives any amount of labor we try to build our home is going to again bring us to ruins because it's like it's just like a pack of cards if you try to build a big mansion out of pack of cards what will happen the wind will come it will just be a ruin again so is the effort of man in moral principles in good behavior when we try to raise our family i'm not saying teach them immorality i'm not saying that but morality is not going to take us anywhere until the hearts are changed until they are brought to the lord jesus christ and when they are made a new creation the lord is going to make them someone who can be built up now quickly the third thing that we see is that the lord builds his church you know many a times there are those who call so called uh, workers and and uh, elders and deacons and pastors and all these so called roles that are there they are just mere vessels but it is the lord who builds his church we read in matthew chapter 16 verse 18 the lord didn't give this portion to anyone else and that's why the church stands 2000 years past the statement people have come kingdoms have come and gone people have longed to destroy the church and the gospel work and uh, they came and they went away but the church still stand stall because it is he who is building the church in matthew chapter 16 as peter confessed this famous confession in verse 18 we read and i say unto thee thou art peter that thou art peter and upon this rock i will build my church i will build my church and the gates of hell not just any one living but even hell cannot prevail against it such is the lord of the church he is the lord of the church he is the lord of the home he is the lord of our lives and then he rebuilds and then last but not the least he is the one uh here i want us to turn to acts chapter 15 verse 16 and 17 here is the same portion from the book of amos that is picked up by james as uh, the early church gathered together for jerusalem council there was a debate or there was a question about how much of the law should be put upon these gentiles the gentile church received jesus christ and the gospel gladly they were saved but there were those who called who were called the judaizers who came and were trying to cause them to be circumcised then paul and barnabas and the judaizers they went back to the church at jerusalem and they had a council and in that council how much of the law of the old testament should be put upon the gentiles was a a question in that in that mode james in chapter 15 acts verse 16 he picks up this word from amos james chapter 
15, sorry, Acts chapter 15, verse 16, James picks up from Amos and says, After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth all these things. Why did James pick up on this? He is making this connection from the book of Amos chapter 9. What we see is in verse 12, the raised tabernacle of David, it's going to have extension. It's going to have extension even to the Gentiles that are called by God's name. In Amos chapter 9 verse 11, we read, verse 12 we read, and they may, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. God is the one who extends his church. He is the one who builds his church and he extends his church to the Gentile people that you and I are. And as he extends his church, James is making sure that the Scriptural principle of circumcision of the old covenant and the ceremonial law is not to be burdened over the Gentile church. They don't have to take the, the burden of the ceremonial law, but they, they can be free from it. And so, that is where we find Amos being referred to, where the church of our Lord Jesus Christ is being built and extended. He is the one who is building his church. Not only he builds his church, he establishes his kingdom. As we come back to Amos chapter 9 verses 14 and 15, we read Amos chapter 9 verse 14 and 15, And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build waste cities and inhabit them. And then verse 15 also, I will plant them upon the land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of that their land which I have given them. Here is a promise that God gives in a way of a kingdom that God is establishing with his people. These children of Israel, as they were promised, we see in the end times that there is a great work of restoring God's people in both in a spiritual sense of all the people of God, of the Gentiles to come to be added to his church. And also, in a way, in a prophetic way, we find throughout the pages of scripture that God has a special plan for Israel. We read even in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 and verse chapter 11 as well. Let's read Romans chapter 11 verse 25 as a prophecy. Throughout uh, the pages of the Old Testament, both in Zechariah and uh, in Amos here, and also in the book of Joel, uh, we find these prophecies that God has given with regards to the children of Israel. Um, let me read that for us. Am sorry, Romans chapter 11, verse 25. As the Gentiles who are being ushered in because of the blindness in part upon the, the nation of Israel. Paul, who is a Jew himself, he speaks about the children of Israel and says this in verse 25. He says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. The blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles be come in. And then verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, they shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. God is a God who again, not just that the children of Israel are saved by any other means, it is through the same deliverer, but that blindness that is in the nation of Israel is taken away and we find this fulfillment in these last days, especially as, uh, as we see in the time of tribulation given through revelation 
we find that God is going to establish his kingdom and into the millennium as we see in one of the millennium view that God's kingdom in, in, a, in a physical way that we see in the millennium rule that we find these scripture portions pertaining to the millennium rule that we find them being fulfilled. Now, there are questions that uh, come out from different views that are there when it comes to millennium view. But uh, a God is not a God who fulfills partial promise of Israel and then leaves the salvation part utterly left out. In a way, their eyes are going to be opened and be brought forth to have them be saved by the same plan of salvation that God has given to the children of Israel. Now, as I close, the people of God, they are given this portion that we come to take note. That is, in Amos chapter 9, verse 14, as we read that, the last part of that verse we see, God's people's portion is to be restored. The Lord is the one who restores us. He's the one who restores us. Even in our lives, many a times ruins are left because we depart from the place that was a blessing. The scripture calls to us in Revelation chapter 2, as he speaks to the church at Ephesus, that there's one thing that he points out to this church of Ephesus. He says that is a lack, that you have left your first love. When God's people forsake the blessed place and the place where we began, how were we when we came to know Christ? What love did we have for the Lord? What passion did we have for the Lord? What hunger did we have for God's word? What desire did we have for his presence? The Lord says that he longs to restore us to that place of blessing. And as he brings us back to that place, that's where he once again rebuilds. He rebuilds us. And that's the portion of God's people. That when we humble ourselves and seek him again, he's the one who restores us to that blessed place. And in that, we are restored so that we would not only be rebuilt, but we would rejoice. Let's read in chapter 9, Amos verse 14, and then we'll close. In Amos chapter 9 verse 14, we read, I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall rebuild the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit thereof. We find the second part of this verse as a portion of rejoicing. We have this uh, beautiful city of Livermore filled with such vineyards. Vineyards are place of, of such joy. I mean, wine as a commodity is known for something that is known for celebration and joy. The people of God's portion when they are restored and rebuilt, is rejoicing. They are restored and rebuilt to rejoice in Him. And that's a joy that is a lasting joy. They rejoice in what God did in their lives. They rejoice in how He restored back to that state of blessing again. And as they are brought back, the portion of rejoicing is also there because they are established. In verse 15, we'll read this verse and close, which is, it says, And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled out, out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Here is a place that we are established. We are established to be there forever and ever. And the reason that we are established and we rejoice is that we are brought back to this place of true seeking and God-fearing lives, which is where our lives belong. Our lives belong to be established in a place of true seeking and God-fearing lives. Many times we drift away and we bring ourselves into ruins. 
that these children of Israel have brought themselves to. If only we can bring our ruins back to this Jewish carpenter, as a man of God says, let the Jewish carpenter take hold of your ruins and see as you wait, build a masterpiece out of it, whether it be your life and my life, whether it be your home and my home, whether it be your church or the church that you and I belong to as a local church, he is a master builder. He is a true wise master builder. Let him build your and my home and there will be such rejoicing and uh, that is our portion. Let us ask the Lord for his blessing and uh, as we have come to conclude the book of Amos that Lord may be given that place of that Lordship that we may seek him and fear him that our lives are rebuilt and restored and established. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this blessed time that you gave that we may come together in the precious truths that you have preserved to us in the book of Amos. Yes, Lord, it is in seeking you and fearing you that we as God's people are called that we are given this privileged portion of being rebuilt, restored, and rejoice in you. Father, we thank you. We praise you for thy precious word. Thank you for the raised tabernacle of David, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the wisdom that we have in him. Lord, that when we yield our lives to your word, precious word, that our lives are as a wise man that builds his house upon a rock. And so, Lord, we thank you, we praise you for how you take our ruins and rebuild a masterpiece out of it. Our relationships, our lives, and everything concerneth us. Father, we yield ourselves to you. And we ask that you may give us the portion of rejoicing in thee and be established in thee. Thanking and praising you for thy precious word. Submitting all of us into thy loving hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father, communion of Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us both now and forevermore. Amen.